so um i think we are going to give another one minute karen or we can start actually i think it, it's fine whatever you're comfortable with i mean we can go to the hour <laughs> even if we you know go a little bit beyond the hour it's fine by me so <clears throat> if we want to wait a little bit it's fine well i guess uh the ones we should not punish those who are here on time by making them wait so um, everybody, thank you for letting us know where you're joining from. Um, my name is Irene. I'm really, really delighted to introduce you to Professor Karen Ferreira Myers. Um, I was telling her that I don't know how to introduce her because she's, <laughs> I admire her so much. Um, however, I'll say something <laughs> that she's the coordinator uh, of modern languages or linguistics of the Institute of distant education at the University of Eswatini. Um, and I am going to hand over to her to continue from there. Thank you. And over to you, Karen. Great. Thank you very much, Irene. Thank you very much for everyone who's joining us today. Uh, it's such a pleasure to see some familiar faces and to get to know other people. It's always lovely to be in the Emerge Africa environment. You know, it's like a little bit like coming home, you know, you feel comfortable, you feel, you know, where you belong somehow. And uh, it's also very nice to see some people who uh, have now uh, been taking the online facilitators course coming to join us here. You know, it, it's a family that keeps on growing and we keep on learning from each other. I must thank uh, both Irene and uh, Jakob for uh, inviting me to come and give this talk about course design. I'm sure, you know, all of us here present are involved in course design in some way or the other. And perhaps uh, in the chat now, you want to write down, you know, what in particular uh, in course design is of interest to you, what you have been uh, working on, Actually, basically, what are you doing when it comes to course design? So I think I would like to know that so that later on, when I have a moment to look at the chat, uh, we, we can see, you know, what kind of information comes out and how we can use that to build on uh, our knowledge and our skills. Um, I know that uh, Tony likes to go into breakout rooms. I'm, I'm more of a a whole group type of person. So we'll all be together here from the word go to the end. Uh, feel free to interrupt, feel free to put things in the uh, chat. Um, we're trying to admit people, you know, while we're talking as well. I know Irene is also busy with that, but I'm also doing my little thing. You know, it, it's always nice to have more people coming and joining us. Right. So as Irene has said, um, I'm Karen. I am uh, originally from Belgium, but I've lived in Eswatini, the former Swaziland, for 30 odd years now. Uh, so that's my my home now. My family is here. You know, this is where uh, I, I, I live and work. Um, I'm at the University of Eswatini. Uh, first, I was the head of a department of modern languages, and in 2010, I migrated to the Institute of Distance Education, where, as Irina said, I'm in charge of um, linguistics and modern languages, basically French and Portuguese. But since then, um, I've been able to uh, do a master in instructional design and technology from the university, the Open University of Malaysia. Uh, I've also taken the online facilitation course and, and, and lots of uh, MOOCs, lots of short courses, and uh, lots of work done in uh, course design uh, in online facilitation here at the university. And um, those who know me know I'm a very keen uh, conference participant. You know, I like, you know, not to get my hands dirty, but maybe to get my mind dirty in, in sharing and in getting feedback. So. That is what I love doing. Now, enough of me. Uh, what I want to talk to you about today, and I can see that my slides are not moving, so I'm going to go out and bring them back in another version so that I can move them along. I think I'm going to leave it like this. I know it's a little bit uh, annoying. Let's see if it wants to go. Okay, that's better. So 
Um, basically, I want us to talk a little bit. I'm going to be talking quite a lot, but at some point I will stop talking. You have to make me stop talking at some point. Um, but I wanted to share a little bit about what we are doing at the University of Eswatini, and in particular at the Institute of Distance uh, Education. And so this is the overview of what I'm going to be talking about, uh, how it started, how it went, how it's going, and how we think it might go in future. So um, this is the session description, which you all have seen. Uh, I suppose this is one of the reasons why you are here with us this afternoon or evening, as Irene likes to call it. Um, and, and, and so this is basically what I'm going to go into. Now, let me just talk a little bit about the context. Um, I hope most of you know where Eswatini is, but if you don't, don't feel embarrassed at all because we're talking about a very, very small country. Uh, in the south, southeast of the African continent, you know, almost in the tip, uh, we are neighbors with Mozambique and with um, uh, with South Africa. Two, I would say, two giants compared to Eswatini. Eswatini is a kingdom, uh, and we are about 1.2 million people. And I can think that, for example, the colleague from Nigeria must be thinking, well, that's a small village in our mind. Uh, in some ways, we can say that Eswatini is a small village. Uh, many of us know each other, so we, we get you know, um, to have a bit of that small village behavior sometimes. Now, let's say a little bit about how we got to that CODE program. Now, CODE, C-O-T-E, stands for Certificate in Online Teaching for Educators. And um, just like all of us, what happened, the pandemic hit us hard. While at the Institute, you know, we had gone online, we had gone blended, uh, we had moved our traditional distance education really onto the internet and in a virtual environment, but the rest of the country had not done so at all. So that pandemic really made it clear that educational stakeholders were ill-prepared to assist learners um, all over the country. So the need for training in online teaching, online teaching and learning actually, was uh, really felt from the start from the pandemic and just kept on getting worse and worse. So at the Institute, we thought, okay, we have this mandate to offer relevant training opportunities to citizens of Eswatini and beyond, so let us design and develop that certificate course. Uh, we were lucky when we approached the Com Commonwealth of Learning, and I'm sure many of you are well aware of the good work the Commonwealth of Learning does. We approached them for assistance. Um, of course, assistance often goes, uh, too, often is too, twofold. On the one hand, financial assistance, and on the other hand, expertise. Call responded very positively. We had a contribution agreement between the Commonwealth of Learning and UNESCO for staff capacity building in open distance and e-learning. And we had then uh, a first project, which was this particular certificate in online teaching for educators. So how did they assist? Um, as I said, financially, but the most important thing was a three-day workshop. Uh, a call-appointed facilitator coming from Said, uh, Dr. Mklanga, we all know him. Ephraim came uh, to assist us. Uh, that was done uh, in a virtual manner. Uh, module writers for that certificate in online teaching so that we would all as a team get a better understanding of online pedagogies and principles and then start developing uh, the, uh, the modules, the course materials. Uh, so what must I say about that? We were lucky to be able to get together a team of well-seasoned uh, course instructors, course designers, and online facilitators so that these skills could easily uh, be transferred from one expert to the next. And uh, I must say it all worked well in a 
convivial in an amicable manner uh, where we all knew we had something to offer and we had a lot to learn. So at the end of that workshops, uh, we had a strengthened capacity in online learning design. We had also identified resources, open educational resources that we could use for our certificate in online teaching for educators. And we had also well appreciated the importance of integrating uh, a wide range of learning resources, but also um, modes of delivery, ways of looking at teaching and learning. So we had a team of eight facilitators who designed at the onset a four week course with four modules that were to be taken consecutively. And here in front of you, I'm not going to go into detail, uh, but unless you want to, and then we can go back to it later on. Uh, we, had four we have four modules, IDE 101, which is design and development of online learning programs and courses. 102, which is creating digital learning materials. 103, which is developing online facilitation skills. And 104, which is creating authentic online assessment. And then of course, you can see from the description, the synopsis of the, of the modules that, you know, lots of things uh, went into that. Now, we're talking course, uh, course design, course development today. So let us look a little bit at the steps we uh, undertook to get there. So at the beginning, we had a team discussion on the titles and the content. That was very important. We had all kinds of educators in mind, um, primary teachers, secondary teachers, high school teachers, um, lecturers at colleges, lecturers at university, uh, even people from the ministries, uh, so that they could also better understand how online teaching operates, how it works, and how uh, young and older learners can really benefit from this type of uh, teaching and learning. So that was the first thing, a team discussion, very informal, a brainstorming session, where everybody would come and contribute as much as possible. And then we started developing module scripts. Uh, we have an in-house template that we use for that, which has been very, very uh, useful. Uh, and um, that, of course, made us move quite quickly. I must say our time for this, the time frame was very short. Uh, basically, we started discussing in uh, June, July, by September, we had started uh, drawing up, you know, a, a, a firm plan. In October, we had our workshop and by December, we were ready to roll. So after the module scripts were developed in teams, then uh, we reviewed, we revised the module scripts and we submitted them to call. Uh, where Dr. Planga um, Ephraim was again uh, so kind to at least have a look at them and tell us, okay, this might work, this might not work, think a little bit more about this, perhaps add this or uh, take that away. Things like that were discussed um, nicely. And then we uploaded the module content and the activities on Moodle. Language editing was done proof reading was done and then we were ready to pilot and that is something that i think in course design we sometimes overlook we are so keen on uh, getting a module or a course up that we forget you know some of the quality assurance steps that are so important so essential so that language editing that proofreading was one of those steps but the most important step step was the piloting and i'll get to that a little bit further. Um, let me see. It looks like my slides have done the same. So I'm going to go out again and do this again. In the meantime, I can have a little look at what is going on in the chat as well. And I can see uh, that people are happy to talk about course design. Um, and, 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 and I think, you know, that's one of the topics I am tackling uh, within the broader discussion of our certificate in online uh, 
uh, teaching for educators. So this is where I was okay. and this is where Karen. I'm going. Yes, Irene. There's one question from Tony that says, yes, what please. is the time commitment required from participants? Ah, yes, I'll get yeah, there, but the I, end, I, yes. let me give you a scoop. The time okay. commitment, uh, after piloting, we noted that four weeks was actually not enough. So we've extended it to six weeks and we ask our participants to set aside about two hours per day. So two hours for some, it is more than enough. For others, they have been saying we need much more than that. Because as I said, uh, the audience we're working with is so varied. Uh, we are not, we are asking them whether they have worked online, whether they follow the course, but basically we're accepting everyone who is an educator. So we really have people who um, can write in Word, can, you know, uh, make a document in Word, but can't go and work on Google Docs. We have people who are unable to um, trans, I mean, uh, um, um, or now I'm looking for a word, uh, are unable to change, to transform a Word document into a PDF. But then we have people who've been teaching online for quite some time, who know how to give an online lesson in Zoom, for example, or in Teams. So that variety has actually been very good for us because it means that when we encourage people to work together, those skills are quite easily transferred. So let me now go back to the presentation. I hope I've answered Tony's uh, question at least partially. So um, from we, we launched in January last year. Uh, we sent out a call for applications. Uh, as you can see, quite a high number of applications were uh, received, mostly from within Eswatini, but already with the first intake, we had people from South Africa, from Zambia, uh, from Ghana, and, and you will see even in the second intake, we've gone even further. So from the, from the African continent, we may say people have shown an interest. And from those, uh, we were able to enroll five cohorts. So now let me explain a little bit why we are working in cohorts. We are working in cohorts of 50 because we want to be able to give uh, individual attention to whoever is within a cohort. We all know that it is possible online through a MOOC or in a, in a big online course to take more people. But those of you who have been facilitating online also know that if the group is a bit smaller, then uh, we can give much more attention and I think much more uh, deeper learning can happen. So we decided uh, that 50 would be enough. And here you have some um, visuals, some photos from uh, groups that have uh, graduated, that have been certified since that time. Uh, the only time we see people face to face is when we invite them for graduation. We try to make it a, a pleasurable uh, afternoon or morning where we really celebrate the achievements that have been made. So let's look a little bit at the course objectives. So they are broad, as you can see, and they are linked to each module. So at the end of the course, the participants are able to design an online lesson or a course to create digital learning materials, to teach and facilitate online, and also to assess online. If we break it down, you can see here quite a, a, a lengthy list of key competencies that uh, participants acquire over the course of that six week um, program. Uh, carry out a needs analysis in online course de development, apply principles of online program design, uh, design the course, uh, utilize the different functions of a learning management system. And, and luckily, many learning management systems are very similar in the way they are set up. I don't know how many of you are using Moodle. Um, I know that in Southern Africa, Moodle is quite popular together with Blackboard or customized um, 
LMSs in, in some universities, we're very happy with Moodle. I mean, it's free, it can be customized quite easily. There's lots of plugins so we can add um, different activities. So for that, you know, we are quite happy with Moodle. Being a small university, uh, being a cash strapped university, it really works for us. So more competencies are the identification and use of software and authoring tools, uh, then the creation of useful, engaging and interactive digital learning materials, the appreciation of the role, skills and competencies of an online learning facilitator. And here I am sure that all of you in the chat could put down some of those competencies that are key for online facilitators. So now I'm actually talking in particular to those people who are with the team, you know, where Irene is one of the main facilitators. Just tell us what are those key competencies? And I'm sure we're gonna have lots of activity in the chat. While I look at other competencies, the management of an online discussion, uh, the planning and facilitation of a live online lesson, the creation of authentic and engaging, engage, engaging rather online assessment activities, the feedback that has to be uh, immediate, that has to be strong, that has to be constructive, and the development of strategies for uh, authentically assessing online. One of the important issues that comes up time and time again are the ethical issues, and I know um, Emerge has talked about this. Maybe this is something we can talk about again in the near future. Those ethical issues, the plagiarism, the cheating, uh, the contract cheating. I mean, I'm, I'm sure we all know what we are talking about. Now, you know, for Tony's sake, but for all of your sake as well, the course structures, as I said, is four modules, 101, 103, 102, 103, and 104. They are taken consecutively because they build onto each other. What is done in module one then is used also in module two, it gets back in module three and module four, so that, that some of the skills um, are not uh, developed in one go, but we all know that learning happens over time and that uh, some form of repetition is actually useful. So two hours per week, we've set aside seven working days per module, and we've made sure that there is always a weekend. Now you're gonna tell me, well, the weekend is for resting. Yes, the weekend is for resting for those who have worked hard during the week. But if you need a little bit more time, then that weekend can be used for that. Uh, each module uh, is facilitated online, on the Moodle platform, but we complement it by interactions on WhatsApp. Now, why WhatsApp? Um, if we did a poll now in this particular group, I think we would find that most of us, if not all of us, use WhatsApp. We use it mainly for personal social interactions, but more, more and more, we also use it for professional interactions. So we have seen that those WhatsApp groups are extre extremely useful. So what we do for each uh, module, we have a particular WhatsApp group um, where the facilitating team, those are five people, two facilitators, an e-tutor, a technologist, and a technician, together with the 50 participants form a group where we encourage each other, where we remind each other of deadlines, uh, where we deal with uh, technical issues. You know, sometimes Moodle is not up for one or two hours, so then we alert each other not to get discouraged because you can't get onto the Moodle platform, things like that, and that has really worked for us. We've been really happy uh, to have that complement our Moodle, our main Moodle platform where uh, we share all the content and all the activities. Now we're using a lot of online teaching and learning approaches or methods, um, readings, lecture notes, 
screencasts, audio, videos, a lot of discussion fora, uh, individual and group activities. So we try and vary it as much as possible. Uh, there are assignments, compulsory ones in each module, and all our assessment includes participation in the online activities proposed. And then at the end, people can walk away with a beautiful certificate in online teaching for educators. And at the end of my little talk, I will talk about how that little certificate has already uh, benefited some of our participants in a big way. Now, of course, I've spoken a little bit about quality assurance. Uh, we're also doing some surveys of um, participants. Now, in the pilot program um, where we worked, okay, Irene, you want to come in, please go ahead. There is a question that I think is from the last slide. Uh, it's from Tony, and Tony is asking four teams of five or some overlap between the module teams. It's it's about how you have set up the the facilitation. The yes, the teams. Yes. Okay. All right. So, uh, when, before so when we did the pilot program, we actually had one facilitator. No, we had two facilitators. We didn't have an e tutor. We had two facilitators and the technologist. And then we noted that many of the questions or many of the issues were often technically uh, inclined. So what did we do then? We added a technician. So the technician and the technologist move with the participants. So they are with them from module one up to module four. So that's an overlap. Those two ladies, and they are really excellent, move along so that they can uh, assist wherever the need rises. Then we have per module, two facilitators and an e-tutor. Now we added an e-tutor because we noticed that that was really necessary. We needed an extra person to be very much hands-on, to be very much, um, I would say almost 24 hours a day available. We've tried to limit that 24 hours because that is not humanly possible, but that is a person who is uh, very much available. Now, where did these e-tutors come from? And that was really exciting for us. When we did the pilot program, we worked with 11 participants and we noticed very soon that even though some of them had absolutely no knowledge or skills when it comes to online teaching or facilitating, we noticed that some were really behaving like fish in the water. They were happy, they were enjoying it, they were interacting fully. And we thought, isn't, there, isn't this a good way to kind of reward them of all that participation by making them e-tutors? So from within the program, we were then able to offer them, um, you know, a, a little job, a little side job, uh, so that they can come and share that enthusiasm and share that motivation with the next one. And also explain that when it becomes a little bit hard, they shouldn't despair because the e-tutor has actually gone through the whole program, him or herself. So we thought that was a really nice way uh, to operate uh, in that manner. Tony, further questions on this part? Or additional ones? Or anyone else? Okay, I see Bolanle is giving us a thumbs up. Thank you very much. Or is it, yeah, or is it Tony? It's probably Tony. Uh, great, okay. Then let me go back to our surveys as part of our quality assurance system. I don't know how it is in your universities, in your institutions, but uh, quality assurance is actually something that we've only stepped into the last few years. We've only now really understood that quality assurance has to be built in from the word go, is something that we need to observe and examine uh, throughout whatever we do. And so with the pilot program, we had a survey at the beginning and at the end of the program, and also at the beginning and the end of each module. 
Uh, these were surveys for both the students and the facilitators, as well as the technologists at that point. This information that we gathered through those multiple surveys was really, really useful uh, for us to improve on the program that we had designed and develop, developed. So as I said, we launched the fully fledged program in January 2022. Since then, seven cohorts of 50 participants have finished the programs. And the response rates uh, on those surveys for the first five cohorts were between 55 and 70 percent. Now, I don't have to explain to you that getting feedback on a survey is one of the most difficult things to do. We all struggle with that. So when we saw these numbers, we were really excited and we really thought that whatever comes out of those surveys, we need to use it to improve what we are doing. Uh, some of the responses, I'm not going to go into details because that's not the point of today's uh, chat, is what we were asking them. How useful did you find the activities? And then this is uh, a survey for module one where you have the different activities, the different topics. You can see them, I hope. But let me just say it had to do with basic concepts of uh, planning and designing. It had to do with learning theories. It had to do with blended learning design, uh, planning for content uh, development. Those were some of the things that were done in um, module one. Then we had also questions on course materials. Were they useful? Were they uh, helpful in increasing knowledge? Uh, were they helpful in, in um, getting to understand the course topics. Did they complement each other or not? Uh, and you can see from the uh, answers we got that it was generally very positive. Um, then we also had some questions regarding the course facilitators. Were they explaining well? Were they well prepared for the sessions, for the online sessions that we had? Um, were they giving useful feedback when activities were undertaken? Was feedback done in time? Was it useful to build onto, et cetera, et cetera? So as I indicated, uh, those initial service surveys were extremely useful, and they showed that there were some shortcomings, which then allowed us to adjust both the content and the mode of delivery for the next intake. Um, we also wanted to make sure that uh, people wouldn't be taking uh, activities or responses from previous groups and just inserting them in the next group. So we were trying to minimize uh, some form of cheating as much as possible. I mean, we know we work with adults. We don't expect cheating to happen, but it does happen. So with the next intake, we made sure that we changed our assessment activities and our activities so we put in a, a, a bit of more of variety so that we could minimize that type of behavior. Uh, and we also limited the number of synchronous activities. Now you're gonna tell me a synchronous activity is so nice because we can see each other, we can talk to each other, but they are, as we all know, also shortcomings. And uh, one of the issues with synchronous activities is uh, limited connectivity, the price of the data bundles, uh, the Wi-Fi connections that are not always working, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Again, I'm sure that in the chat, some of you can share what are uh, the disadvantages of synchronous activities. So we have limited them uh, because we know some people here are in uh, rural areas where getting online is a task and a half. So that's what we did. And we are still doing surveys. Now we only do one at the beginning of the course and one at the end, because we don't want to overload our participants with surveys. And uh, what is coming out is still allowing us to improve on what we are doing. Right, I just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the synchronous and asynchronous activities, the wikis, the chat, the forums, etc we've noticed that there is a marked preference for the asynchronous ones. And there, you know, we can see that this is very similar to what other researchers in other parts of the world have also observed. Um, 
This doesn't mean that some participants have not extensively used and benefited um, from those synchronous activities like a, a, a live lesson, uh, a, a Zoom um, interaction, or a Moodle chat environment. And it's that chat environment that I just wanted to talk a little bit more about. Uh, I'm one of the facilitators in the fourth and final module. That is the one dealing with uh, authentic online assessment. So today, uh, over 300 participants have completed the program, and uh, many of them, most of them, have taken part in the chat opportunities. Now, we give them two chat opportunities, uh, one on day one and one on day two of the seven-day Module 4 interactions. And we make sure that on day one, uh, both the facilitators and the e-tutor are actively participating in the section in the session. So for an hour, we are online, we are asking questions, we are guiding the discussion. We are really trying to make people comfortable uh, of being in that chat environment. After that, we take a step back and we let the participants uh, do what they want, basically. We leave the chat environment openly accessible for the whole duration of the module delivery, every day at the same time. Normally, we have one happening lunch hour, so between one and two, and one happening uh, between five and six. And what we saw was actually quite amazing. Many participants would organize themselves, go back to that chat environment, and discuss course-related topics um, throughout that period. So that is quite exciting, I think. Uh, it shows how relevant, useful, and necessary the chat uh, environment is. Now you're going to tell me, what about those who cannot synchronously participate? Are we leaving them behind? Well, no, we aren't, because Moodle has a very useful function with the chat, is that it transcribes whatever is being shared in the chat environment. So that transcript is then available when you go onto Moodle and there is a section called past chat sessions. You click on it and you get a chat log of the written chat, which is accessible to everyone in a particular course or module. So I think that is something very, very useful to be built in, in uh, an online or a blended course. Right, just a little bit about those chats, uh, that they are textual products. Um, and uh, some researchers have shown that um, there is uh, quite, it's, it's quite a cognitively uh, intense activity because people are monitoring the chat, wanting to react, and also looking at the keyboard to make sure that, you know, what they put in uh, is of relevance and is useful to the others. So, um, what a chat in this way allows is that we can revise our text and uh, address new topics as they come up. So I think those are useful uh, functions in a chat. Right. Um, I don't think I want to go a little bit further into the chat. I think we can talk about it uh, also. I just want to um, come and talk a little bit about the challenges and the successes we've seen, you know, just to wrap up this session. It's been a real roller coaster ride uh, from us, for all of us in the facilitation team, but also for the participants uh, since August, September 2021 to today. So almost a year ago, well now a little more than a year ago, we started talking, we had that workshop, we started developing, we constituted teams for writing and facilitating, and we've had a lot of time to reflect on our practices, on the content, on the mode of delivery, on the challenges and successes, uh, as well as the administration and budgetary uh, issues. So I thought, OK, let's do a SWOT analysis, but it may be nicer if I call it a code analysis. And let's look at the code analysis. So the C stands for challenges. What challenges have we met? Ensuring quality at all times is one of the major challenges we've had. Uh, we've also had to deal not with real burnout, but we've had to be careful um, with our team not to um, 
give them a too heavy workload. All the team members are people who have a full-time job, so we're adding on to that. So we, we need to really think about that even further for the future. We've had financial constraints, um, the data costs. You know, when we're at the university, when we're in our uh, normal work environment, we do have internet, but sometimes it's not there and then we still need to assist. So this is when our smartphones need to be reloaded with minutes, with data, so that we can keep on interacting. That goes hand in hand with the connectivity issues. Um, we've also had some challenges with some participants' attitude. Um, I remember in the first intake, uh, one of the first days we had started working uh, in module four, uh, some uh, participant actually started um, being very nasty to another participant in front of all of us in the WhatsApp group. And we had to explain uh, some of the rules of netiquette all over again, which we normally do in our orientation session. But we had to say, OK, if you have an issue, um, let's sit down and talk about it as adults. Let's not insult each other. Let's just be kind and understanding. And then we can easily sort out whatever issue you had. So basically, dealing with that showed us how much communication is important. So that's also one of the challenges. Now, in my code analysis, the O stands for opportunities. And opportunities have been manifold. Um, the growth of the course offering within and outside the country, as I said, we've had participants from many different countries in Africa, which has been really wonderful. Uh, we've even had uh, a few from India joining us. So this is something that is really nice because um, then I'm going to, you know, give a, a, a wink to Irene when it comes to diversity and inclusion. If we can bring together people from different walks of lives, from different geographical areas, then I think we are really all learning from that. Um, opportunity would also be to offer code in other languages. For now, it's not yet an opportunity, but we really would like to do that. The cohesion of the team, uh, also the fact that we can now do uh, team research, publish as a team is something very important. It has allowed us to put IDE, the Institute of Distance Education, on the map within the country first and foremost, because as you all know, uh, online learning, blended learning has for a long time uh, been uh, the little abandoned uh, family member. I think, you know, offering this course has really given us that opportunity to show that, you know, online learning is possible, it's feasible, it's useful, it can really uh, make a difference in people's life. And so personally and professionally, all the team members, in addition to the participants, have been able to develop, to grow, uh, to learn from each other. That's also something important. Now, in my code analysis, the T stands for team. Uh, the team spirit is something that we keep on growing. We have each other's back. We acknowledge where things go right, but we also point out where things go wrong so that we can find solutions together. This listening and learning from each other is so wonderful. I'm sure you all agree with that. And communication, communication, communication. I mean, I'm from a language background, so I cannot stress communication enough. Now, the last uh, letter in our code analysis is the E for experiences, and the experience have been, um, what can I say? Now I need to use expletive, so give, them, give me some in the chat. It's been wonderful, it's been uh, magnificent, it's been extraordinary. Uh, we've had experiences with the team, the participants, the content, the facilitation, the interaction time management, very importantly, and, and, and the list is endless, I would say, of the uh, positive experiences we've all enjoyed. So as of today, uh, for the next intake, for intake two, we've had 287 applications. They will be closing soon. So if you know anyone or if you're personally interested, 
uh, get on to www.ide.unesco.ac.sz or get in touch with our administrator, Ms. Msibi at sbmcb at unesco.sz. Uh, you are welcome. We are looking forward to you joining us at a nominal fee of 3,000 Emalangeni, which is about 220 or 30 US dollars. So I think it's quite affordable. At the moment, we are training cohorts six and seven. Uh, cohort eight is the one you can still join soon. It will start on the 17th of October. And we always start with a Zoom orientation session where we explain how we work. Um, we would love to get financial support because we want to offer the course at least in Siswati, French and Portuguese, and if possible, in many other African and international languages. So if you know of people who've got money and who would like to invest, please give me a shout. So as a team, we know we are the main stakeholders and the role player of where the arrow goes, how high and how steep, but it's definitely going up. And with that, I would like to end my little talk and now go back to the chat and see, you know, what questions I have overlooked or I haven't talked about and maybe get some feedback from you or some additional questions. Irene, over to you. Oh, wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Oh, that, that, that's awesome. That's really great. Um, I had one question about the, the fee. How did you decide on, on the fee and how much is it? Okay. And then, the, the, uh -huh. yeah. That's what All right. The, the, the fee uh, is now 3,000 Emalangeni. It is payable in maximum two installments. Uh, how did we get to it? Well, we, we pay our facilitators, our tutors, our technician, you know, everybody involved. We pay them. It, it's not a proper uh, fee, but we pay them something, more like an appreciation type of thing. And so we need to have at least 30 people uh, in a cohort to break even. So what we're doing uh, with the excess money is we're now, we have started uh, buying uh, laptops for our facilitators, for the team, so that they don't have to depend on their own personal devices. Uh, we would also like if money allows us to give people some money for the data costs they incur. So, so that's how we, we actually determined the fee. It corresponds to about 220, 230 US dollars for that six week uh, fully inclusive course. That's not bad. Yeah. That's quite it's about 2,000 rand. Yeah, it's about 3,000 rand. The, the Malangeni and the rand are, are similar. Okay. Ah, okay. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Tony. I'm sure you can see them, um, Karen. Yeah, I can see yeah. them now. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Now, the course materials and the facilitator guidance, will it be released as an open educational resource? Hey, Tony, we've had so many discussions here within the university. At IDE, that is what we wanted to do. That is also what we kind of promised the Commonwealth of Learning that we were going to do. The university says, for now, um, because we need to make some money with it, we can't. So for now, you know, bits and pieces are open educational resources, but the whole is not an open educational resource, unfortunately. We're still advocating for that. We do have a contract with call. Yes, yes, yes. And I know somebody's going to get kicked in the butt because of that at some point. <laughs> Thanks, Tony. We need the success. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, yes, yes. And then can you pay via EFT? Definitely. Um, colleague Matthews Mangaliso, there is no issue whatsoever there. I'm going to put uh, the administrator's at, uh, email address in the uh, chat, and you can definitely get in touch with her. It's missmcb 
and uh, she will definitely, you know, follow up with you or with anyone else you know that might be interested. Um, thank you, Tony. Yes, it's, it is an amazing story of a, a baby born uh, during the pandemic. I, I agree with that. Thanks for that. Right, and I can see also Stephen Sosa being interested. Please, please get in touch with our administrator. We look I, forward to having you in the course. Yeah, I, I think this is quite interesting. I, I think people need to send the email to get more details about the course. Um, I'm just going to be, uh, uh, just to ask, um, do, how did being in the online facilitating course help in this process that you went through? Did it help? Uh, or at what point does it help that you went through the facilitating online course offered by Emerge Africa and the University of Cape Town? Yeah. Wow, uh, Irene, I mean, you, 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 we remember each other. It was quite some time ago. It was well before the pandemic. And I must say that uh, that course opened my eyes. I learned so much. Uh, it really it really showcased what can be done in an online environment and how important that skill of online facilitation is. You know, that building of rapport, that following up on questions, that giving of feedback, that um, pushing for more discovery, that, um, you know, all those little bits and pieces put together. I think, you know, for me personally, that was one of the steps to that that aided in in getting you know even our institute of distance education at this point in time i am really i mean i'm i'm one of you know uh, the advocates of the emerge you know online facilitation course because it is such a wonderfully structured and organized course so yes the benefits have been maximum Okay, thank you. Um, do you think you will have um, from the feedback that you get from your participants, do they want a part two of the course? Do they usually give that feedback and are you thinking of that or you just want to grow this baby fast? Ah, great, great question. Okay, the, from the word go, the question has been after the certificate, what then? Now we are mounting a postgraduate diploma uh, in open distance and e-learning that hopefully will start early next year. We're actually busy, uh, we're again working in teams, we're busy you know, designing and developing the modules. It will be a blended learning format. Um, so we, we're forging ahead. Uh, that certificate basically it is to allow all educators to get some basic skills and knowledge. And then it's up to an individual to say, okay, I need more, or now I can do something. And I actually, I forgot, I should talk to you about something else that has happened in the meantime. One of our participants um, was in cohort two, I think, immediately after taking the course came to us and said, listen, we're going to start uh, an online academy that will be assisting uh, primary students, I mean, pupils and uh, secondary and high school learners as a form of tutoring online. Can we get in touch with the participants of your code program? We will then train them in particular uh, topics that we would like them to be able to do but we want to start with people who already have a basic knowledge and that has happened. So that is also something that has been a great achievement. Uh, that, is, <laughs> that is awesome because I, I think uh, that is a, a constituent that we kind of don't think about. We always think about the later part of education, you know? So mm -hmm. I think that will, will it be something big and that's something uh, people will need to learn from so yes thank you for sharing that uh, that's interesting and and quite um, inspiring story thank you so much anyone else with a question anything from you tony you really want more questions from me 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, Karen, I'm really interested in the whole issue of sustainability. You talked mm -hmm. about the fact that your team were already working full time and we're doing extra to do this there. So, so there was some support and there was some financial incentive and recompense and recognition, but yeah. um, to continue in the same way at the same pace with the same staffing is clearly unsustainable. Mm -hmm. What's your route forward? Right. I have, okay. So what we've noticed is that we also have lecturers uh, from within the university and from other university in Eswatini joining us. So we, we are thinking of identifying, like we did in the, in the pilot program, of identifying colleagues uh, who are keen, who have shown motivation and interest to also bring them on board. Uh, for now, um, we'll probably end with cohort eight, but if we have enough interest, we might still have a cohort nine until the end of this year. And then we will regroup and analyze what we will be doing next year. So yeah, yeah, thanks for that because yes, it, it, it is quite hectic. And then I can see the question about the postgraduate diploma. Um, we are working on it. Ideally, we would like it to start in February, 2023, but if it's delayed, definitely by August, 2023. So that's an answer to uh, Jacob Rading's question. Yeah, so uh, what, what is your parting shot for all of us? Because we, um, you know, we, we, we love what you've just told us. We're excited about it. And, and you've noticed that quite a number of people will be talking to your administrator or the person that you know, you've shared the email. What, what is it that you'd like to share about course designs and, and, and your, the journey that you've been on? All right, okay. Um, in a nutshell, um, I would say, don't be afraid to start something. Uh, start something similar or different. Uh, get in touch with us if, if you want more information or if we can see how we can team up. Um, work through the steps diligently. Don't take shortcuts. Keep quality assurance in mind all the way. But also, and I think again, I must, I, I must, I'm looking at Tony and at Irene, but also have fun. You know, enjoy what you're doing. I think we can't do anything right if we're not enjoying it. Um, bring in lots of people with different backgrounds, um, hold a lot of brainstorming sessions. I think that's what I wanted to say. And my last parting shot would be, I hope your state of mind is now even more positive than it was at the beginning. And that's it for me. Uh, <laughs> Thank you so much uh, for, for, for a wonderful session. Thank you for agreeing to even have the session. I know you're very busy. And thank you everyone here for coming. We appreciate you. We appreciate your time. And we'll be sharing more events that are upcoming. We might get Karen to come back again. So please do join us uh, when we share some of these sessions. They are usually very, very educational. Uh, so that said, uh, Bye for now, and we'll see you soon in a different uh, event. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Bye. Oh, you want us to do the, the <laughs> open our, our, our cameras and, and just wave at each other for those who can, huh? Yeah. 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 Well, the ones who in uh, yeah, this is the fun that Karen is talking about. You know, you have to bring a little bit of playfulness in your learning, otherwise, uh, That's we, the shall point. All, yes, we shall all <laughs> grow old without playing. <laughs> <laughs> this is not your experience, Irene. <laughs> no, I play all the time. That's uh, and, and perhaps <laughs> I like playing with 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 learning because if you don't, then you get bored or. It gets monotonous, so yeah. 
So thank you everyone and bye for now. I think we, we can close now. Yeah, bye.